what up welcome back to the daily dose you guys we are hitting up day number you know what day it is today let me to tell you day number 56 yes that's right 56 all right so today we have got a supplemental video from our friends at read scripture aka the bible project so go check that out we are still working on our way through the first portion of deuteronomy and we have got chapters 10 through 12 today we've also got psalm number 56 56 we're going to be looking at so our summary for today starts off with um tablets like the first ones so the scripture talks about how you know moses had broken the first tablets he came down from the mountain after um god had carved them with his own hand basically and when he did that, he saw the whole situation with the golden calf and, and Moses got angry and dropped the tablets and they broke. So he went back up on the mountain and he was up there for another 40 days and nights. The second time that he went up to get the reinscription of, of the Ten Commandments, he was up there again for another period of 40 days and 40 nights. Um, so we just kind of revisit that a little bit. And then we look at um, just the whole concept of fearing the Lord, right? That's the next topic as we continue reading is fearing the Lord. So it talks about what God asks from them, right? So what does God ask from them? God says that that they need to fear him, that they need to serve him, and that they need to do that with all of their heart and with all of their soul, okay? I want to touch on the fear part again because People, it, it, people will often read the Old Testament, and what they see is they see a God of anger and a God of wrath and a God of fear, um, just because sometimes the stories um, highlight some of those qualities of God, um, maybe a little bit more obviously than they highlight some of the other qualities. Um, I don't believe that the God of the Old Testament is a different God from the God of the New Testament. Um, so I, I just wanted to to talk about the whole concept of fear. And we've talked about this before, so just bear with me, guys. Now, I think that this kind of fear they're talking about is not like a dog that gets beat cowering in the corner, paralyzed in fear every time his owner walks by, right? I, I don't think it's that kind of fear. I think it's more of a, of a reverential fear, a healthy fear and awe and respect. And let me kind of give you an example. So um, I, I heard a, a pastor friend of mine tell a story and it, it's a fictitious, a fictitious story, but it illustrates this principle very well. So um, there was a girl. She went to a high school, right? This girl was in high school, and, um, and she was in, you know, 10th grade, 11th grade. She wasn't one of the cool kids uh, because she was a believer, and she made it known that she was a believer. And so from time to time, her friends would ask her to go to parties and, and go hang out. And normally she wouldn't go, but they finally talked her into going to a party. She went to a party, and it was held at uh, one of the popular kids at school, one of the jocks. His parents were out of town, so he was having a party. And there was alcohol there, you know, a keg, bottles of liquor. Um, people had drugs there, and there was a lot of peer pressure going on. And so... You know, they were saying, hey, to, to this girl, I said, hey, why, why don't you take a drink? Just, here, do a shot with me. And she said, no, I don't want to do that. And they said, well, well, look, here, at least drink a beer, right? If you're not going to do a shot, drink a beer. And she said, no, no, no I, I, I really don't want to do that. You know, I, I appreciate your offering, but I, I have to say no. And I said, okay, well, look, just take a hit of this, right? We, we've got a little joint here. Just take a hit of this, a um, little marijuana. And she said, I'm not going to do that. And so <clears throat> her friends and the people that were having the party, you know, they were just kind of ridiculing her and they were saying, hey, you know, why, why are you so afraid? You're so scared. You know, what are you afraid of? Just do it. Why are you so afraid? They kept calling her a chicken and, and saying, you know, you're afraid. And, and so finally one of them said, you know, what, what, are, what exactly are you afraid of? Are you scared? Are you nervous? Um, are you afraid of your parents, you know, and, and what they're going to do if, if they find out? And when they said that, the girl got 
kind of a weird look on her face. You could tell that they struck a little bit of a nerve when they said that. And so they pressed the issue. They said, oh, you're afraid of your parents. What, are they going to ground you? You know, what, are you afraid of your daddy? Is your daddy going to beat you up? Is he going to slap you? Are you afraid your daddy's going to hurt you? Right? And she looked at this, this person that said that, dead in the eyes. And she said, I'm not afraid that he's going to hurt me. I'm afraid that I'm going to hurt him which is why I'm not going to do this. And so for her father, she had a reverential respect and awe and fear, but not so much fear of what he would do to her, but fear of displeasing him, given all the things that he had done for her as she was growing up. So I think that's a beautiful picture um, of... Uh, one way to look at fear of the Lord, right? Not so much fear that he's going to come down and spank you, um, although I think there is a certain type of fear of his power that, that we should have, um, but a fear of a fear of, of hurting him, not that we're so powerful we could hurt God, um, you know, in, in a physical sense, um, but a, a fear of insulting him, a fear of sinning against him because we don't want to disappoint him. So anyways, I'll, I'll leave that there. You guys think about that. Um, so from there on out, we go to look at where it talks about loving and obeying the Lord. And that's a good point because so in the New Testament, uh, we see Jesus saying, if you love me, you will obey me, right? So there is, there's this, this link between love and obedience. Love and obedience. If you love me, you will obey me. You will listen to me. You will care about what I desire. You will care about what I want. You will try to make that happen, right? That's what agape love is all about, the kind of love that we're supposed to have for Christ. Uh, but, but so it goes on and it says, you know, you saw the great things that God has done. Therefore, observe my commands. And whenever we see that word therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what is it therefore? Because it's a linking word. It's kind of like saying because. Or so that, right? So in this case, you saw the things that God has done, the great things that God has done. Therefore, so because of that, observe my commands. Um, and then God goes on to say that if you obey, then I will bless you. And he sets before them blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. From there, um, we, we move on to look at the one place of worship. And so God talks about um, leading up to this one place of worship. God says that, you know, when the Israelites take over new land, when they come across uh, places of idol worship, they're supposed to, to completely destroy those places, um, those shrines, those altars of idol worship. And then God says that, you know, not only do I want you to destroy these places of idol worship, but you are also not to worship these idols at all anywhere else. So destroy the places of worship, and don't worship the idols in any way, shape, or form, even anywhere else. And then God goes on to say, look, not only do I want you to do that, but you're also not allowed to worship me in any way that you want. You can't worship me in the same way that these pagan nations worshiped their gods. That's not appropriate. So God is, is dictating um, how he wants to be worshiped, and he talks about where he wants the people to worship him at. So we've just got some some instructions here that talk about that. So uh, the one thing I did wanted to touch on as far as my point of interest for today uh, comes to you from Deuteronomy 12, and this is from verse number 32. So if you guys will bear with me, let me get that pulled up right here. Doopa doopa doo. All right. So and so this is the last the last verse. And this is after it talks about, you know, the one place of worship and the blessings and the curses. So it says, see that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. This is, um, I believe that this is a sobering word to anyone who is involved in the ministry particularly, in, in, in any way, in anyone who is involved with, with teaching the Word of God, 
um, or talking about the Word of God. And, and I guess technically that would be all believers because we're a, a priesthood of believers, right? And we should all be um, be sharing God's Word with people. So I guess this applies to any believer, but in particular, anybody, a pastor, anybody who exposits the Bible, um, it says do not add to it, to the Word of God, to His commands, to what He says. Don't add anything to it or take away from it, right? So sometimes when when I read the Scripture, um, depending on where my mind is at, I can um, be tempted and sometimes subconsciously, I can be tempted to take what I'm reading and manipulate it ever so slightly to fit my point of view or to fit a, um, a worldview that I have. And, and I may be slightly changing or slightly adding to what God has said, and I may be doing that incorrectly. And if I am, that's a big problem. It really is. And in the same way, we're, he, he says, don't take away from it, right? And when I read that, what I see is, okay, everything that I've said in the Bible, and this is just my interpretation of that, I, I feel like th- this kind of gets to the heart of what he's saying, is don't, don't take away from it. Make sure that all of it is known. And, and that's one of the reasons why I am so big on, um, on, on exegetical preaching, on... I'm, I love to listen to sermons and attend churches where the pastor will preach through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Um, one of the pastors that I have grown to respect over the years lately, there's been some controversy around him, um, but John Piper, he's a, a Calvinist pastor up in Minnesota, and one time he preached through the book of Romans and I've got all of the audio tapes of, of this sermon series. I don't remember exactly how long it took him, but I think it was eight years that every single Sunday he came in and preached the book of Romans verse by verse to his congregation. And it took eight years, right? And I listened to every single sermon. I absolutely loved it. Okay, and one of the reasons that that I think it's important to approach the Bible in that way is because if you do, you're not going to leave anything out, right? You're not going to take away from it. It's it's my personal belief, whether it's right or wrong, you don't have to agree, just my opinion. It's my personal belief that when when a church does like a sermon series, or, or something, a, a series on a certain topic. It's very, very easy to go through the Bible and pick and choose passages of the Bible that talk about that specific topic. In fact, that's, that's kind of natural. I mean, that's what I would expect someone to do. If you're teaching a sermon series on joy, I would expect you to go through the Bible and find passages that talk about joy and to preach on that, right? Um, but as I see it, the problem with that is how often... Do people do a sermon series on sin or on adultery or on drunkenness or on repentance or on if you do not forgive others, I will not forgive you, right? There's a lot of topics in the Bible that are some sometimes scary to talk about. There's a lot of topics in the Bible that make people uncomfortable, um, especially unbelievers, and I think that it's very easy to pass right by those if a congregation is not being led through the entire Bible, basically one book at a time. Now, the downside to that is, yeah, it, it might take a really, really long time to get through any section of the Bible, right? And I guess there could be an argument to be made that, okay, well, if you preach in that way and you're preaching that slowly— um, you might might only get through a few books of the Bible, and then somebody in the congregation might say, "You know what? I'm I'm sick of this. I'm leaving." And they might leave before they hear you preach on a book of the Bible that maybe is something that's going to be more meaningful to them. So I I get it from both sides of the story. But again, I, that's just my opinion, and I get my opinion from this verse. Do not add to it or take away from it. 
um, a, a brother in Christ of mine, Skip Heitzig, he says that he, as I, he believes that the Bible is the word of God, that it was breathed from God. And he believes that from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, the 66 books that comprise the Bible, Skip believes, as do I, that God covers all of the topics that he deems to be important. And the ones that are more important, he covers more frequently, right? So that if you were to start at the beginning of the Bible and preach all the way through to the end of the Bible, that, that you would talk about everything in the same um, ratio that God talks about it in the Bible. And I, I really love that about, about Skip's preaching. Um, so now all of that being said, I'm not against topical preaching. I'm not against sermon series. I don't have some sort of problem with it and, and think that it all needs to go away. I'm not saying that. I'm just letting you guys know what my preference is and, um, and why I hold those preferences and those beliefs. So anyways, that's just kind of a, a, little, um, a little tidbit for you guys about me. So anyways, thank you so much for being here today. I always appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys. I always appreciate you guys joining me, and um, and that's all the time that we've got. So, you know what to do if you haven't already. Go down below, drop a like, share the video with a friend, drop a comment, let me know if I'm way off base and I've got it twisted, or just say hello. Show some kind of love for your boy. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. And until we meet again, deuces.